And now please join me for the first scripture reading in unison, which is Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3, which you can find in your Bibles, in the pews, or up on the screens. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the years of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. And now we invite... Ken Meyer for a mission highlight. Good morning. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for your support over the years. It does mean a lot to us living overseas where uh, we are still living by support. And uh, my wife works part-time at the Christian School of Vienna, but I myself am still able to be full-time in ministry uh, because of supporters like you and this church. So thank you so much for that. And I've been serving over in Austria since 2005. Um, I, for some of you might know, I did grow up in this church pretty much as attending from pretty much the time I was uh, able to walk. I'm not exactly sure. But anyways, greetings as well from my mom and dad. They have successfully now moved to their new apartment in Verona. So that's a big, big answer to prayer. And they're continuing to get used to the new place. But my mom's here. And so you can say hello to her. Afterwards, I'm also, of course, joined by my wife, Michi, and daughter Evelyn and son Oliver, nine and seven years old. And what's also rather exciting is we have a little one on the way. So uh, as of October, we will have three children. So a big change coming up. And as for uh, the ministry that I'm involved in, I am serving part-time at a place called The Oasis. It is an outreach to refugees that are new in Austria. But I'm also the co-pastor of our church, Calvary Chapel of Vienna. So I've always found that photos tell the story best. Uh, This first photo is of the Oasis. This is a ministry that's been there since the mid-80s, reaching out to the refugees that continue to arrive in Austria. And we're about 300 yards or just down the street and around the corner from the main refugee housing facility of, of, of Austria, where they first arrived, get checked in, and so we're able to welcome them, offer them coffee, tea, some clothing, And currently, we are greeting and meeting refugees from a a whole variety of different countries. Uh, Not as many, not many from Ukraine as you might think, because the Ukrainians are actually immediately given permission to live and work in Austria. So they don't actually have to go through this complicated refugee asylum process. And anyways, the refugees we're meeting are from still from coming in from Syria, uh, also many from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. India as well, um, different countries in Africa like Somalia, Nigeria too, Morocco, Tunisia. So it's a wide variety of, of people that we get to connect with. And it is such an awesome opportunity to share the truth with them because for many, in many cases they're coming from countries where there's very few churches and very little freedom to attend a church if there are churches that are public. Uh, the next photo is simply of the clothing room. So here you see our clothing being ready, getting ready to be given out uh, piece by piece. It also serves as this would be the women's room. So uh, they can try things on right there. A huge blessing for them. And then an open door to connect with them and invite them to the other program events. The next photo is our, um, okay, I guess the, something got cropped out there by mistake. But these are a few refugees that are Arabic speakers. In the front, the gentleman, I guess somehow it didn't come through in the photo, is Lazi, our Arabic-speaking evangelist. But the next photo is our uh, Bible closet. So here is our one of my favorite rooms in the place because we have boxes of Bibles available in about 50 different languages ready to be offered. And it is quite a challenge when it comes to the language barrier sometimes. Um, and on one evening a few weeks ago, we, we do not have a translator for Urdu, the main language of Pakistan. So some gentlemen came in from Pakistan, and these 
four or five guys who are open to watching the Jesus film. So we invited them to the, the back room for that. So while they were teach while they were watching the Jesus film in Urdu, uh, some other guys came in from Afghanistan. One of them could understand English very well and could translate from English into Dari, one of the main languages of Afghanistan, but his friends knew Pashto. So as it turned out, what we ended up doing was I taught, I shared the gospel in English, he translated into Dari so that his neighbor could translate it from Dari into Pashto for the other three guys that were there listening. So it was a real uh, challenge, but it worked out nicely. And I believe each of them, or a few of them anyhow, took some flyers to, to read further in their languages. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what it's like at the Oasis. Uh, the next photo is my friend Farid. He's from Syria, but he moved to Vienna a few decades ago. And this is a little simple kind of painting that I do sometimes, the, this style of painting to, to paint and preach through a message. And as you can see, this is uh, comparing the law of the temple or a temple versus the grace of Jesus Christ. And which way will you choose to go? Try to make it through works, or will you just accept the grace and forgiveness in Jesus? But I preach at Farid's fellowship about once a month, and, and he translates from my German into Arabic. And that's always a, a real blessing to, to get to share with people in his fellowship. The next one is, here we are at church, uh, the Calvary Chapel of Vienna. And uh, a smaller fellowship, but been there for over 20 years. And it's really international as we teach in English, and then it's translated into German there. So there's a wide variety of uh, nations that are present each Sunday. And there's about 30 people, uh, give or take. And I'm the co-pastor, but interestingly enough, my co-pastor is from California. His name is Brian. And He's a very smart guy, and he's finishing his law degree. And so once, Lord willing, his plan is that once he finishes his law degree, next summer he'll take the bar exam in California and begin practicing, uh, well, practicing law, find a job out there. So he's actually planning to move to California with his, or where he's from, back to California with his family next summer. So in order to help with that transition from uh, the co-pastor role to me being the pastor, that's going to happen already in September. So I'll be the pastor in, as of September, and he'll serve as my assistant. So, yeah, you could pray for that transition to go well. But as far as Vienna goes, the next photo gives you a little bit of an idea of the size and scope of the city. This is from a rooftop uh, near where we live, the IKEA building, actually, which is now in downtown Vienna. And it's a city of about 2 million people, so a lot of people to reach out to. And it is a very nice city. And you might think, wow, it must be amazing that you have to live in Vienna. But uh, it is a challenge because these, this is just spiritually a dark place. There's not very many born-again believers. Um, the Viennese people are known to be complainers and known to be complaining and grumbling all the time. And so to visit as, as a tourist is nice, but it's a whole different experience when you're just living there. And interestingly enough, a lot of them would also dream of getting to move to America and live near New York City kind of a thing. And, oh, wow, mustn't, that must be awesome kind of a thing. So they, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side sometimes, right? But the next photo is uh, me and there's my daughter, Evelyn, Oliver. And this is Pastor Chris. He's my pastor from uh, South Jersey. He was visiting to encourage the church there during this year, and that was really neat. But um, the next photo is of our recent baptism. We got to baptize five people. This gentleman is named Johannes. He's from Austria, and he came out of the New Age and esoteric movement and was just really rejoicing to find true forgiveness and real life in Jesus as he just found yoga to bring him nothing but emptiness. And the other gentleman who got baptized in the next photo is Sorhab. He's from Iran, and I've been able to disciple him now for these past six months, so a new believer, and he knew that Islam was wrong a long time ago, but uh, thankfully a couple of Christian friends gave him a New Testament to read in Iran already, so that inspired him to seek further, but as he found no freedom in Iran, he ended up deciding to move to Austria, and so now he is going through the refugee asylum process. The others that we baptized, uh, well, there was one other gentleman from Iran, and then a, a married couple from Afghanistan. So just fantastic uh, news there. And lastly, 
there's a nice photo of me and Evelyn up in the Alps. So we, are, we have this tradition now where we go up for a hike in the Alps once a year. So that was a real joy getting to do that. But in closing, I just want to read a verse which is not unlike part of the scripture reading or prayer that we had already this morning uh, from Isaiah 9-2. It's a traditionally read by Christmas, but I find that this also applies so well to speaking the truth and bringing light to people from these spiritually dark nations. Isaiah 9-2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So yeah, we praise the Lord that Jesus is reaching people from these spiritually dark countries and also right there in Vienna. Lord willing, he will continue to pierce the darkness that is there and, and bring his truth to the people uh, of, of Vienna, the Austrians as well as the other uh, foreigners who are living in Vienna now. So please do continue to keep us in prayer. And if you'd like to learn more about our ministry, just um, when you grab a cup of coffee afterwards, our sign-up sheet for our newsletter is in the next room near the exit door. And you can feel free, too, to grab a piece of Austrian chocolate, uh, whether you sign up for the newsletter or not. So anyway, it gives you a little idea of what, what the Lord is doing over there. But yeah, again, just thank you for all your support. And uh, yeah, we praise the Lord for what he's doing. Amen. Thank you, Ken. At this time, we invite the children to, to come up for a time with the children. Okay. When I, I hope you recognize your letter. We're going to spell out a word. I got the first letter. Who has? Does anybody have an R? You got the R. Who has the I? I think you do, Jeremiah. Can you stick up your eye? I bet some of you older ones can figure out what the word's going to be. Who has an E? Can you put it up? Who's got the N? Yeah, that's my N. You can do it. Put the tape on it and tape it up there. And what's left? You do it. We have a D. And what did we spell? Friend. Friend. Okay. Raise your hand if you have friends. Who has friends? Yeah. Friends are great, aren't they? What's um what's something? you like to do with your friends? Anybody want to volunteer? What do you like to do with your friends? Go outside, especially in this beautiful weather. Play video games. Play video games. See, that's the same, even though he lives in a different country. Friends like to do the same thing. What do you like to do? Play games. Play games. Jeremiah, what do you like to do? The pool. Oh, yeah. In this hot weather, sure, everybody likes to go swimming. Well, did you know that the Bible tells us about friends? The Bible has stories about friends. Way back in the fall, I think before you guys started coming, we learned about some friends, Daniel, and he had some friends. I bet you know that story, what happened to his friends. But they stuck together. They were good friends. There are some stories in the Bible about BFF? What's a BFF? What's that? Best friend forever. There were some of those in the Bible. I bet you didn't know that about David and Jonathan were BFFs. Friends to the end. Friend ends and end, and they were friends to the end. The Bible also tells us how to treat our friends. There are verses that say friends are kind. Be kind one to another. Friends love at all times. That one's hard. Sometimes friends have arguments. We don't always agree. Um, but there's another verse that says, sometimes when you fall down, it's good to have a friend to help you up. Friends love each other. They're kind. And they help each other. Do you ever help a friend? Do you? 
I've seen, sometimes I substitute at school, and I see at recess, the kids are playing soccer. All the, how many of you like to play soccer? Yeah, soccer is a fun sport. Or maybe it's football. Do you call it football in, in Austria? Yeah. They love to play that at recess, and it's all about football, all about getting that goal until their friend gets hurt, and then everybody stops and runs over because they're being good friends, and they help it. Help them. Um, I, go to your school. I know I get to see you sometimes at recess, don't I? Well, Miss Norma's going to talk about friends, and she's going to talk about how they help each other, how important it is to help one another. Now I'm going to show you a little something in my bag. You ready? Are you ready? You sure? You ready? Right? This has something to do with the story, and you're not going to believe it. I bet you won't even know what it is. Do you know what this is? It looks like a rock, doesn't it? I bet some of the grown-ups know what it is. It's a roof. It's a piece of the roof. It's the tile off a roof. Hmm. Wonder what's going to happen. Maybe they're going to build their friends a house. Would you need this if you were building a friend a house? Yeah. Or maybe this one fell off. Maybe a roof tile falls off. <gasps> Would you have to help your friend if he got hit? Yeah, well, you better be really good listeners. Maybe a coffee hour you can tell me what a roofing tile had to do with friends in the Bible. Bible is a really cool book with some really awesome stories in it. So can we all stop and fold our hands and pray and just thank God for all our friends and ask him to help us be a good friend this week? Can we do that? Okay. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you've given us friends. We thank you that you've given us your word who is, teaches us how we should treat our friends and that it reminds us that we need to help our friends and to love them. Help us to be loving and kind this week to our friends. And thank you for Miss Norma. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and there are some papers in the back that you can, if you didn't get them before, you can go back and get there's some papers, there's some drawing, and listen to what Miss Norma has to tell the grown-ups because there's something in there for you, too. Okay? Today's scripture reading comes from Luke the fifth chapter, the 17th through the 26th verse. One day while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem were sitting nearby. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down in the stretcher through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and Pharisees began to question, who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who is paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your stretcher and go home. Immediately, he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen incredible things today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask for your anointing today. 
I ask for anointing to hear what you want to be heard and for anointing for me to speak what you want said. Grant that the words of all of our mouths and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This story is about four interconnected things. Friends, faith, conflict, and revelation. And these elements are so intertwined that if one is missing, the story is incomplete. The friends have faith, and the conflict leads to the revelation. One could say that there are four players in this drama. The friends, the paralyzed man, the teachers of the law and Pharisees as a group, and Jesus. But before I go on, I would like to encourage you, if you have not read the book of Luke in a while, to read it again. Luke is a masterful storyteller, and he uses an economy of words to communicate his point of view. And he also uses silences to move the narrative forward. But back to the text. Jesus has been to Capernaum before. In his earlier visit, Jesus casts a demon out of a man. People are amazed that someone had such authority that demons obey him. And they obey him twice. Because first of all, Jesus does not want their testimony. So he tells them to be quiet. And they are quiet. And then when he commands them to leave, they do. And this power over the demonic force sends people scrambling to find their sick and afflicted friends and relatives because they want Jesus to heal them. Meanwhile, Peter has opened his home to Jesus. And there Jesus finds Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever. He stands over her, rebukes the fever, and she gets up to serve him. And just as an aside, the word here, serve, is the same word used for deacon, or it's a derivative of the same word used for deacon. Deacons perform holy service. This woman performed holy service in serving Jesus. Now ultimately, the people who sought out their sick friends and relatives bring them to Jesus, and he heals them all. What about the four friends? Where are they? Did they arrive too late? Were they part of the group that tried to prevent Jesus from leaving because they wanted to take advantage of his healing? Jesus refuses to abandon his itinerary. His intention is to go to Judea. Did he promise to return? Or had he already, at this point, made Capernaum his base of operations. According to Matthew 4.13, early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus sets up his base of operations in Capernaum. Peter lives there. Andrew lives there. James lives there. John lives there. Matthew lives there. But this is all before Jesus calls them to serve. So it appears that now Jesus has returned home. Having failed to get their friend to Jesus the first time, these four men are determined that history is not going to repeat itself. And unable to get through the door with their friend, the four men resort to breaking through the roof to lower their friend to Jesus. Jesus should condemn them, shouldn't he? They are destroying someone else's property. What right did they have to do that? anxious or not, determined or not. But their actions demonstrated faith, the faith that was necessary for their friend's healing. And you're, most of you are familiar with this, this text, Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because the one who comes to God must first of all believe that God is or that God exists and that God rewards those who seek him. 
James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead. Works are the proof of one's faith. One could even say that faith is the currency of the kingdom. Nothing can get done without it. Jesus sees their faith, the friend's faith, not that of the paralyzed man, and he responds. Our faith, yours and mine, is powerful, not just for us, but for others as well. And don't tell yourself, my faith is too small. Because Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. When I was a child, um, one of the pastors um, of a, the church that I belonged to used to give out things. One time he gave out, I remember him giving out handkerchiefs, and that was based on acts and the habit that people had of attaching handkerchiefs to Paul's body so that they can then take those handkerchiefs to the sick and afflicted among them so they would be healed. On one occasion, this pastor was giving out a necklace that had a mustard seed in it. Now, the mustard seed was in liquid, so it looked larger than it was, but even then you could tell it was a really small seed. The Lord is not concerned with the size of our faith. What's important is that we have it at all. Now, the paralyzed man doesn't say to Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me walk again. In fact, the paralyzed man doesn't say much of anything, anything at all, and he seems to serve as more as a, a prop or a plot device. Ooh. Jesus does not require faith from the paralyzed man because the faith of his friends is obvious, and it is their faith that Jesus responds to. Seeing their faith, Jesus then addresses their friend. And let's look at him for a moment. Why was this man paralyzed? I'm thinking about the question Jesus asked, uh, that was asked of Jesus by the disciples in John 9, 2, with the blind man, the man who was born blind. They asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind? For most of us, that's a ridiculous question because how's a baby gonna sin, especially a baby in utero? But Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus knows that there were certain teachings and ideas that were prevalent in his day. Instead, he focuses on the man's blindness as an opportunity to show the works of God. That is an intriguing question, isn't it? For the most part, Jews do not believe a child can sin in utero. In fact, many Jews don't believe in original sin. They believe that all people are born with the inclination to do what is right and the inclination to do what is wrong. And it is by faithful Torah observance that they will follow the inclination to do what is right. I looked at a commentary because I was trying to find, is there anything that says Jews believed in sin in utero? And I found a reference to the man that was born blind that said he was born blind as punishment for prior sin. Huh? The writer quotes Genesis 25, 22 and 23. I'll not read them, but this involves Esau and Jacob in utero struggling with each other. In fact, Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord to find out what was going on, and she learned that her sons were going to be at odds for most of their lives, and that the older would serve the younger. They also quoted Psalm 51, verse 5, in which David says he was born guilty, a sinner when his mother conceived him. And scriptures like that were used to support this view that, yes, it was possible for children to sin in utero. That was not the mainstream 
thought. But we need to understand that Jews did not walk lockstep. There wasn't one uniform belief. There were offshoots and different groups that held to different things. And apparently, the disciples were exposed to this particular train of thought. But I will give them credit. They asked the one person who would and could give them the right answer. And Jesus redirects their focus from blame toward the works of God. The second part of the question, however, fits the Lord's pronouncement to Moses in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness and truth, who keeps love and kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Jews definitely believed that sickness was caused by sin and certainly demonic assault. A Torah observant Jew was believed to have been protected from these outcomes, specifically because they obeyed the Torah. We don't know if this man was born paralyzed, and it's entirely possible that he sinned and had not repented. But just to go back into Israel's history for just a moment, while they were still in the wilderness and the tabernacle was constructed, before it could be used, God gave the people a series of offerings to atone for sin and cleanse the tabernacle because sin not only created guilt on the part of the sinner, it caused contamination to the tabernacle. And so the purification offering was designed to do two things, atone for sin and cleanse the tabernacle. Because if the tabernacle accumulated too much contamination, God was not going to remain there. And if a person sinned without realizing it, the expectation was that Jesus would that I'm sorry, that the Lord would somehow reveal their sin to them. But sometimes people refused. They got sick, some died, and some had their lineage wiped out because they died childless. Because think about it, refusing to repent is an act of defiance. The answer to the question of the cause of this man's paralysis may be found in Jesus' response to the faith of his friends. And this is where the conflict flows into Revelation. When Luke mentions that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were present, we can assume that they would be the source of conflict. But Jesus invites conflict because people do not recognize him for who he is. Why were the teachers of the law present? It wasn't mere curiosity. The teachers of the law would go around from synagogue to synagogue to hear what was being taught to ensure that the correct interpretation was given to the people. They were the ones that were professionally trained to develop, teach, and apply the law. And they are here to hear what Jesus has to say. And one of the reasons there was such a focus on proper interpretation of the law was to ensure that all Israel would participate in what was called the Olam Haba, the world to come with a new creation. Jews believed that that age would follow the Messianic millennium and after that, individuals and nations would be judged by God, and only the faithful would live on in the new creation under God's rule. Sound familiar? Teachers of the law weren't the only group concerned with the coming kingdom. The Pharisees, although not an authoritative group, were also concerned with adherence to the law and the life everlasting. The Pharisees were interested in Jesus because they sensed 
a kindred spirit. This doesn't remain to be the fact of the matter for the entire time of Jesus' ministry. But they wanted to hear for themselves what Jesus was saying and whether this young rabbi really taught the authoritative interpretation of the scriptures. And we know Jesus did not. Jesus did not need anyone else's authority. He spoke on his own authority. Now, as of yet, Jesus hasn't said anything that the teachers of the law or the Pharisees disagree with, but that's about to change because Jesus is teaching and then he stops because debris, grout, and possibly even tiles are falling from the ceiling. Jesus looks up and stops and he sees four men lower their friend on a bed almost into his lap. And seeing their faith, Jesus says to the paralyzed man, stand up, take up your bed and go home. Well, that would be the most logical thing for him to say because it's obvious that man needed healing. And that was the expectation of these four friends. And they might be thinking, okay, that's all very well and good, but our friend needs to be healed. What about his healing, Jesus? That's why we brought him to you. But Jesus is responding to this man's greatest need. Granting forgiveness of sins suggests that the paralyzed man is in his current state because of sin. And now we're going to see how the conflict and revelation go together. Jesus was doing fine up until now. But now it's like, who does this guy think he is? Why is he blaspheming? Only God can forgive sins, and that's the critical statement. That is the critical statement. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy, but Jesus hasn't blasphemed. And if he had, they would have cried blasphemy, and they would have torn their robes, dragged Jesus out of the synagogue, and stoned him. They knew he hadn't blasphemed. But what they did recognize that Jesus claimed God's authority and in so doing claimed to be equal with God. Now the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were right that only God can forgive sins. But what they didn't realize that God incarnate was sitting right in their midst. Jesus challenges their assumption with a question, which is easier. Just say your sins are forgiven or to heal a paralyzed man. So Jesus uses this question to equate the, the two things. If you say yes, that I can heal this paralyzed man, you have to know that I have divine authority. And so Jesus turns to the paralyzed man and says, your sins are forgiven. And then stand up, take your bed, and go home. And this is the only time we see or hear anything from this paralyzed man because he gets up, takes his bed, and leaves the synagogue rejoicing. If Jesus can heal, Jesus can forgive. You have to wonder how they could miss that point. In Luke 4, when Jesus is in his hometown and he reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am the anointed one through whom God will bring about the restoration of Israel. And the people understood. Some thought, but this is Joseph's son. How can this be? Others thought, but this is Joseph's son. Can it really be? Jesus was very explicit about who he was in this passage today. And what was the crowd's reaction to Jesus' revelation? We have seen strange things today. Well, they had seen strange things, but did they not hear? Did they not understand? 
The people of Capernaum were like the people in Matthew 13, 14, and 15, to whom Jesus spoke in parables. And of them, Jesus quotes Isaiah 6, 9, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes. And parenthetically, this is an act of will. Closing one's eyes is an act of will. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their hearts, and understand with their heart in return, and I would heal them. And perhaps this is why in Luke 10, 13 through 15, when Jesus is delivering woes about certain cities, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the deeds of power done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. Capernaum has seen Jesus perform great miracles. They have seen him and heard him teach with authority. And in spite of this, they did not perceive. They heard, but they did not understand. Dull hearts, deaf ears, closed eyes. They missed the revelation. They never realized who Jesus was. But we know. We know who Jesus is.